first thing I want to say to you is a very big thank you to David Young for the invitation to share with you this morning. I asked David what he would like me to preach on, and he indicated to me that he'd already preached Matthew 1 and 2 in the lead up to Christmas, and it would be good if I could share 1 Matthew 3, the appearance of John the Baptist just before Jesus begins his ministry. As it happens, I was preaching in our own little church in Tyab for the three weeks before Christmas. Uh, sometimes they let me do that. Um, and I also preached on Matthew 1 and 2. Not having preached John the Baptist before, this is a very good opportunity to do so in the light of the nativity narrative in Matthew. I'm having to learn from my own advice here. I have always held that if you're preaching a passage from one of the Gospels, then you should look very carefully at what comes before and what comes after because the Gospels have been structured in a particular way. Always check the context in which it resides. In this case, Matthew's nativity narrative comes before this uh, passage about John the Baptist, but there will be links to it. Matthew carefully planned what he wanted to write, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And the following chapter, we have the account of the temptation of Jesus. And then in Matthew 5, we have the Sermon on the Mount. So while David and I have both just recently preached from Matthew 1 and 2, we did so with different purposes in mind, which of course influenced what we shared in December. I was looking for three Advent messages that would not just tell about Jesus' birth, but would emphasise why he came to be the saviour of the world. From my observation of the texts, Matthew describes what we could easily miss with our familiarity with the Christmas story. My series was called Christmas in Matthew, a radical beginning to a radical ministry. My purpose was to sharpen our focus on the radical nature of Jesus and his earthly mission. David, on the other hand, took a longer term view in bringing these first two chapters of Matthew to you. He's using them as a foundation for sharing with you the material Jesus challenges us with in the Sermon on the Mount, which comes a couple of chapters later. In telling me about this, David used the words countercultural to describe Jesus' message and ministry. This is where our intentions converge. What I perceive to be radical in the whole lead up to Jesus commencing his ministry, David describes as countercultural. So it would appear that we are actually both on the same page. Now, with your indulgence, because all that was shared back in December and we've had Christmas and a whole bunch of things happened since then, I just want to quickly revise uh, what was in Matthew 1 and 2. Matthew 1 begins with a great list of names. Uh, in this case, the genealogy from Abraham to Jesus through, uh, yeah, through Joseph, his stepfather. Normally, when we encounter great lists of names like this in the scripture, we tend to skip over them, don't we? I know I do. But this list, this list is worthy of our attention. There are names in there that we do recognize that which is not the case in other places. Matthew includes it to establish Jesus as a Jew. And remember, Matthew is a Jew writing for Jews, and he wants his uh, readership or the people listening to it being read to understand the, the Jewish heritage of Jesus. He establishes him as one not just born to be king of the Jews, uh, but being of the line of David which was very important in their, their, their cultural and spiritual heritage. As I observed this list, there are two lineages that I saw in the first 17 verses. The first is, it can be divided into two. You have verse one and you have the rest. Verse one is this. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, son of David, the son of Abraham. Way back in Genesis 12, God established a covenant with Abraham that he would be the father of a great nation, a nation that would bring blessing to all the people of the world, and ultimately that's you and me. 
Uh, despite the struggles of this emerging nation, God renews the covenant with Moses, with Joshua, and of course with King David. So we see we have this lineage of covenant. There's a thread of covenant going right through the Israelite history. Uh, history. In the other 16 verses, we have this great list of names, 42 men in the line of Jesus. Being a patriarchal society, that's not a surprise to have such a long list of men. Uh, it was the men who, uh, the eldest in the family, the eldest son in the family, who then took on the family line. And so, of course, all the men are remembered. It's not unusual. But in this list, in Matthew, there are five women. Whoa, that's a little bit radical. In a patriarchal society, why would there be even one woman, let alone five, on the list? Um, women were really regarded as little more than chattels to be used, and in many cases, some in this list, abused by the men around them. Uh, worse than being women, four of these women were also Gentiles. But what are they doing in the line of an Israelite king? And worse than that, three of them had very questionable morals. Mary is the last one mentioned. Um, she has no uh, bad ticks against her name, other than that she's just a teenage girl from the back blocks of the vast Roman Empire. She was a poor mock nobody from nowhere in Portland. But she is a picture of God's grace, to be chosen by God to be the mother and the saviour of the world. By faith and by grace, she willingly accepted her given wrong. The four other women are Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba, and each is an unfolding story of the immense grace of God. Tamar was a Canaanite married to one of the sons of Judah. His wickedness brought about his demise. She then, as a widow, as the cultural tradition demanded, marries the second son, who despicably abused her by ensuring that she would not give birth to an heir by withdrawing from her at the critical moment each time they lay together. His wickedness also brought about his demise, and she was faced with having to marry the third son, who was not yet of marriageable age. But Judah had already lost two sons to her, and he was not about to let her marry the third, and so he prevented the marriage. Knowing that Judah was departing for a trip, she set out ahead of him, and disguised herself as a temple prostitute, if you don't mind. These were common um, in Canaanite pagan worship practices. There were plenty of them around, and she would not be, um, she'd not stand out in the crowd. He fell for the trap and slept with her, and of course she became pregnant. Months later, when the pregnancy was discovered, Judah demanded that she be stoned, because she didn't, he didn't know who she was. Uh, but when uh, she produced his seal and his staff, which he'd given her as payment, for her services, he knew that he had done the wrong thing by denying a marriage to his third son. He then declared her to be more righteous than he. Uh, by faith and by grace, she has been included in the line of Jesus. Her motive was right to ensure the family line continued. Rahab didn't pretend to be a prostitute. She ran a house of ill repute known to all, including the king of Jericho, where she lived. By grace and by faith, she hid the two spies Joshua had sent to observe the land they were about to take. She even lied to the king uh, when the two spies went that way, she told the king they went that way, uh, just to make sure that they were safe. Another Canaanite in the line of Jesus, adding further shame and disgrace to the family line, but redeemed by the grace and mercy of God. Ruth, though of excellent character, was a Moabite, a people on God's band list 
for the Israelites. Ruth's story, especially of her commitment uh, to Naomi and her desire to love Naomi's God as her own, is a beautiful love story of the grace, mercy and love of God and she too finds herself in this lineage of grace that is the family line of Jesus. That lineage of grace is a book type from Grant Sanders. I I trust some of you have read it. We come to Bathsheba. She was probably a Jew by birth, but she would be declared to be a Hittite, having married Uriah, one of King David's famous fighting men. We don't know how complicit or otherwise she was in the adultery with King David, or the subsequent murder of her husband in the failed cover-up of the Union. Losing the son of that Union, God gave them a second son, Solomon, who of course then went on to become king after David. By grace and by faith, she is included in the family line of Jesus. Some of the men were surprising inclusions. Abraham and Isaac were both deceivers. Jacob turned deception into an art form. David, as we mentioned, was an adulterer and a murderer. Yet each of them, by grace and by faith, find themselves included in the lineage of Jesus. This gives us all hope. You, me, all of us, because we are no better than any of those sinful people that we just mentioned, because we are all sinners. Every one of us, there is no escaping the fact, we are born in the sin, we live in a sin polluted uh, environment, and we, we are trapped there. But for those who believe, we've been by faith and by grace redeemed from that predicament. The second half of Matthew 1 is the account of the birth of Jesus. Uh, key verse in that passage is verse 21. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will. Some of you know your Bible very well. Save his people from their sins. The verse describes the hinge point of the whole scripture from Genesis to Revelation, it all hinges on this point. She will give birth to a son, you will be giving the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. It's been meticulously planned from the very beginning. It's not an afterthought on God's part uh, that there should be a way for humanity, a fallen humanity, created in the very image of God, to be redeemed and restored into fellowship with him. Name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. For us, in our time and culture, these words of the nativity narrative bring us great comfort. They help us to feel good, knowing that we've heard the good news for ourselves and have responded in faith to them. This feel-good experience a combined with our familiarity with the Christmas narrative, can easily lead us into a false impression of what Mary and Joseph were experiencing at that time. This is a radical plan that God has set into motion and there will be some radical consequences. Consider the timeline that Matthew sets out for us here. The angel comes to Mary at a time when she is betrothed to Joseph. Betrothal in those days was a big deal, as big as a marriage. Usually a betrothal would last about 12 months. It's a formal arrangement. Uh, in that time, the wife-to-be stays at home with her parents. The husband-to-be stays at home with his parents. They don't come together uh, until the actual marriage is performed further down the track. Uh, it, Joseph's family, even in the poor circumstances, that they were in, have given money as a dowry and contracts have been signed. The only way out of a betrothal is by death or by a very shameful divorce. In this context, the angel says to Mary she'll become pregnant by the creative action of the Holy Spirit and Mary accepts this. Can you imagine the reaction from her parents when she is discovered to be pregnant? All sorts of questions would be flying around. Did Joseph force you into this? Or were you equally complicit? 
Did somebody else have their way with you? Difficult questions. And Mary came back with the answer that it was God who did it. Please, put yourself in the position of Mary's parents. Would you believe her? God, God did this to me. It's a big ask, isn't it? The family is now in utter shame and disgrace in their community. Things like this don't happen to good girls, even in a poor village like Nazareth. Joseph then hears the news. He has no idea what's going on yet. He hears the news and he is shattered. And his family are immediately dragged into the shame and scandal of the situation. One thing he does know is that it wasn't him that did it. He knows that. So who did? Uh, there's, he's got no way of knowing. How could he be expected to believe that God was behind all of this? He considers the situation and obviously he loves Mary and he decides to take a course of action that is the least painful for her. As the male, note this, as the male, the female had no such right. As the male, he had the option to sign papers in front of a couple of witnesses to enact a divorce without a formal legal proceeding, all done very hush-hush. But he no doubt feels the shame and disgrace that has been wrought by this pregnancy. This is not a feel-good time for Mary and Joseph, folks. Then the angel comes to reassure him, and Joseph decides to take Mary as his wife and accept the baby as his son. This is no small commitment. Have no doubt in your mind that when Joseph took Mary into his home before they were married, there would have been finger pointing happening all over Nazareth. It just wasn't done. But he did it. This was indeed a radical commencement to a radical ministry that we will see in Jesus. With all that's not enough, in the next chapter we then come to the wise men. Chapter 2. I grew up thinking that these wise men were good men, uh, great astronomers, great scientists who understood uh, the significance of the moment. How wrong could I have been? These men were not astronomers. They were astrologers. They practiced the dark magic arts. They wrote horoscopes for people. They didn't just observe the stars, they interpreted them. The practice that got it out of by the way, for the Israelites. Their most likely place of origin was Babylon, where such magic arts were well understood and widely used. Surely no one from Babylon, one of Israel's fiercest enemies, who dragged them off into captivity for 70 years, would be welcome in Jerusalem even if they were coming to see the next king of the Jews. These pagan gentlemen did get something very right, however. They saw this new star in the sky and they correctly interpreted its meaning. Now note this, there would have also been many other astrologers in Babylon or wherever they came from that would have seen the same star and would have come to the same conclusions, but they didn't do what these guys did. We presume there were three of them because of the gifts, but the number doesn't matter. These men responded to the star, God's way of speaking to them, by the way, because that was their culture in their moment, in their time, by going to humbly pay homage, humbly pay homage to this new baby born to the king of the Jews. Key verses in Matthew 2 2. Uh, they ask the question, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. They came to worship him. These pagan Gentile astronomers came to Jesus to worship him, and worship him they did, bringing very appropriate and prophetic gifts. And they bowed low to worship him. 
people practicing what God had declared to be evil came and bent the knee to Jesus. Later the Apostle Paul had to say this about Jesus in Philippians 2. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue can acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. These otherwise wicked men came and in humility submitted to the authority of the king in front of them. Jesus born not just to be king of the Jews, but born to be the saviour of the world. The fallen humanity that these men so aptly uh, exemplified in their astrological exploits. Once again we see a most radical beginning to the radical ministry of Jesus. All of this has been so countercultural because the later ministry of Jesus was also destined to be so countercultural in itself. This is the context in which Matthew has carefully laid out for us uh, for the entrance of John the Baptist and the baptism of Jesus. Realise, of course, that between the end of chapter 2 and the start of chapter 3, there's a 30-year time gap. He just skipped a few details along the way. To return to the first three verses of Matthew 3, our passage for the day, we'll hear both the message and the purpose of John. Verse 1. In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. There's his message. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. That's his purpose. His message is that the people should repent, and the reason he gives that the kingdom of heaven has come near. According to R.T. France, there's an urgency in the need to respond. Israel has been rolling along in spiritual complacency because there's not been a prophet for the people in over 400 years. They've lost the plot. They have no idea what, what God has is, is got in store for them. Now they have a bold prophet right in front of them declaring an urgent message. Repent from your sins now. The time has come because the kingdom of God is near. John's urgent call is to make sure the people are ready for this to happen. The four Gospels all have different introductions, but they each quickly converge on, in recording the appearance of John the Baptist because he fulfills the prophetic promise that Elijah is to come prior to the Messiah uh, to announce his coming. He is a bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The final words of the prophet Malachi in the Old Testament declare this. Hear these last couple of the two verses from the Old Testament. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Did you see a promise and a punishment in there, a promise and a judgment? You'll hear it again from John Shaw. There is a promise that some will return to the Lord. They will repent because the kingdom of God is near. But there will also be people who will ignore the urgency of John's message. And the consequences will be devastating for them with the further promise of total destruction. Later on, coming down from the transfiguration on the mountain, the disciples asked Jesus why the scribes say that, that first Elijah must come. Matthew 17, 11, describes Jesus' response. Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. 
Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Turning to our first three verses of Matthew, we see another direct quote from Old Testament prophecy. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. This is Isaiah 40 verse 3, if you want to look it up. John the Baptist emerges literally from the wilderness, for that's where he's been living, with the declaration of preparing the way for the Lord, making straight paths for him. So the announcement of the launch of the ministry of the King of the Jews doesn't come with the pomp and ceremony of a military parade up the main street of Rome, nor even a royal procession in Jerusalem, but an announcement from a wilderness dweller who has heard God and obeyed his instructions. That's a bit countercultural too, isn't it? How radical is this commencement of the ministry of Jesus going to be? Just as radical as all that we saw in the Nativity narrative. As William Barclay notes, this prophet we know as John the Baptist emerges not just from the wilderness, but from the very presence of God. Important note here. He came out of the desert only after he had undergone years of lonely preparation by God. He came not with some opinion of his own, but with a very clear message from God. As either ministers of the gospel, like me and David, or witnesses to the truth of Jesus, like everyone who is a Christian, we too must come into the presence of the people we meet who need to hear God's message out of our own personal experience of the presence of God. Not much point is being a witness to what God has done in us if we're not doing so out of spent time, considerable time, consciously in his presence. Barclay adds this clarification. John was preparing the way for the king. This prophetic voice points not at himself, but at God. He seeks to minimise his importance, to focus our attention on the majesty of God and his plan to redeem a fallen humanity. The people recognise John the Baptist as a prophet even after so many long years when no prophetic voice had spoken in Israel, because he was a light to illuminate evil things, a voice to summon people to righteousness, a signpost to point people to God, and because he had in him that unanswerable authority which clings to the one who comes into the presence of people out of the presence of Move to the next paragraph in Matthew 3. We find a bit, out a bit more about John the Baptist, about our prophet. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. He had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. We already have uh, a vision in our minds of a radical prophet emerging from the wilderness. And now this vision is further clarified as we see him dressed in camel hair clothes with a leather belt around his waist. That was countercultural in his day. People didn't dress like that normally. No one else was dressed like that. When we hear about his diet of, wild lo of hunt, locusts and wild honey, um, with such clothes and such a simple diet, it's clear that he is poor. He's very poor to the extent of being on the margins of society. He doesn't come from a position of wealth or privilege. He is a radical person, John the Baptist, specifically prepared for a radical role. Yet despite being so marginalised, it's clear that the people in the towns and the cities have heard about him. The word of him has spread quickly. And people are coming out to hear him and respond to him. Verse 5 tells us that the people went out to him from Jerusalem. You'd expect that. But and then all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, God is clearly at work here. He's preparing a people to hear his truth, his message of salvation that was to be enabled by his son Jesus. And people's hearts are being prepared. You know, God's preparing all the time. All the time. 
We don't know what state the person we speak to next is in and how much work God has done in them before we speak. Some of these people respond by coming out to engage John the Baptist in his message. Many others will not, just like the peers of the wise men who remained in Babylon while the wise men came to worship Jesus. It's God's job through the Holy Spirit to prepare people's hearts. That's his role. It is our job to bring them the good news of God's plan of salvation as he brings those people across our path. We do so with a sensitivity born of our own experience of the sensitivity of the presence of God. In verse 6 we encounter the first of seven uh, mentions of baptism that follow in the rest of chapter 3. And again we encounter the radical and countercultural uh, nature of John's ministry. The baptism that John practiced was unique in Israel's history. Nobody else had ever done it this way before. This notion of baptism was not new to the Israelites because it is a key part of the process for proselytes, for Gentiles who want to align themselves with the Jewish faith, believing in Yahweh as their own God, renouncing all other gods, they were baptised with water as a symbol of that commitment. But here, here John is baptising Jews. That never happens before. He uses baptism as the outward expression of an inner transformation that takes place as people that can confess their sins in genuine repentance. It's an outward symbol of an inner restoration and reconciliation with God. It's clear from the responses to John's, uh, John's message that the kingdom of God is near. It's happening already in a genuine spiritual revival in a people that had become religiously complacent. Myron Altsberger notes that a true repentant not only seeks cleansing from sin, but determines to leave the old life behind to embrace a new life centered on God. Michael Wilson notes that it was no easy matter for the city dwellers to venture out into the desert, but they did so convicted by John's message of the urgency of the nearness of God's kingdom and their need to address their problem for their sin. They demonstrated their repentance by confessing their sins and marked it with the outward, once only, baptism. They must show God both by their actions and their words that they are putting their old ways behind them and they're ready to embrace the arrival of God's kingdom. He notes that this unique style of baptism gave him the byname the Baptist, hence John the Baptist. It has nothing to do with the Baptist denomination, by the way, uh, but he is the forerunner. Of At verse 7 we see a dramatic turn of events that challenges John and he meets that challenge head on. Verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Reduce fruit in keeping with repentance. They obviously had no fruit of repentance in their arrogant attitudes. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. That same, we heard it in Malachi and now we're hearing it from John himself. There's a way to be reconciled with God. You can choose it or not. If you choose not, then there is destruction to follow. As the Pharisees and the Sadducees came out of John, he is aware of their pride and arrogance that they carry out of the prestige of their position, in which they are noted for lording it over the people they're meant to be serving. They had all the scriptural tools at their disposal to know what was happening here, to see that God was inaugurating a spiritual revival among the people in readiness for the Saviour, the Messiah, who is about to commence a radical ministry among them. He's having none of their false piety, declaring them to be a brood of vipers, trying to wriggle out 
of the judgment that's about to be fallen. It's a bold message from John which will be repeated in the life and teaching of Jesus commencing in the Sermon on the Mount. You'll hear these same echoes in that Sermon from Jesus. He even preempts their protest by pointing out to them that they don't qualify for the kingdom by virtue of their pedigree as children of Abraham. It's a personal faith that matters here. This is personal, folks, not family heritage. As the Apostle Paul will later note in Romans 9, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, not, nor because are, they are in his descendants are they all Abraham's children. They're not. It's a personal matter of faith. They embrace Abraham's faith in Abraham's God, Yahweh. And that is the way into God's kingdom, not because they happen to be born into the right nation. As Australians, our nation has a rich Christian spiritual heritage upon which even our constitution has been founded. But our Christian heritage will not carry one current Australian citizen into heaven. We may come from families that have for generations been regular churchgoers and good citizens, but that will not guarantee entry into the kingdom of God. As we noted in the genealogy of Jesus earlier, it is always by faith and by grace. Our belief in the God who made us in his image. It requires a personal commitment that John demanded of those who would repent, turn from their evil ways and be baptised as an outward expression of their inner personal commitment to God. James Boyce notes that no one is saved by his or her ancestry. You will not be accepted by God because your mother was a Christian uh, or because some other godly relative prayed for you. You yourself, I myself, must repent of our sin, put our trust in Jesus, who alone is God's beloved Son and our Saviour. We now come to the climax of this portion of the chapter in verses 11 and 12. I baptise you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not even worthy to carry, not even worthy to be his slave. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Here we get to the core of John's ministry. Wilkins notes that John points ahead and beyond himself to another person of much greater importance. John has a powerful place in God's history of salvation. Uh, Jesus described him later as the greatest prophet ever. But John knows that he is just the preparation for the main event. He is preparing the people for the coming of Jesus and the launch of his kingdom and ministry. While there's a strong continuity in the message of Jesus and John, John wants to emphasize two important differences. Firstly, we observe John to be a person of great personal inner strength. He is rugged, bearing the marks of the rigours of a lonely desert life as a prophet. But John looks to the one who is even more powerful. He will arrive with the power and authority of God the Father, who has sent him on this earthly mission for the redemption of humanity. This more powerful one is called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins, as the angel informed Joseph during the pregnancy. John's language is not self-deprecating. He's not lacking an adequate self-image. He knows who he is in God. He knows his mission is to point to the one to come. He is not important. Jesus is the one who is coming. The other difference John wants us to notice is the difference in their baptism. John baptised with water for repentance. But the coming one will baptise with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John clearly understands that the unique baptism that he initiated will be superseded by the superior baptism of Jesus that comes with the dual promise of Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus will baptise the repentant 
those who are willing to receive him with the blessing, the blessing of the Holy Spirit. But the unrepentant, those unwilling to offer the, uh, receive the offer of, of salvation in Jesus, he will baptize with the judgment of eternal fire. We're getting the same message for it. Redemption or fire. Redemption or fire. Make the choice. There's no half measure. John is speaking clearly and boldly here. Either we believe and are blessed with the Holy Spirit, or we don't believe and we're forever separated from God in that place of eternal fire. It's not a popular message to preach today, but it's one that needs to be proclaimed and proclaimed often. And yet another radical twist to the story. The concluding verses of Matthew 3 describe how Jesus came to John to be baptised. We just noticed, noted that uh, Jesus will bring the superior baptism, but here he is, waiting, standing in front of John, waiting to be baptised. Uh, verse 12. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptised by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptised by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It's proper for us both to do this, to fulfil all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptised, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Well, when we first read that, it just doesn't make sense, does it? John's baptism is clearly designed for the repentant, for those who have confessed their shortcomings and pledged to turn from their wicked ways. But we know that Jesus is the sinless one. He has no need of repentance. Why then does he come to John to be baptised? Well, it certainly wasn't the purification of sin. John described it like this in verse 15. Let it, uh, Jesus described it in verse 15. Let it be so now. It's proper for us to do this to fulfil, to fulfil all righteousness. The answer lies in the concept of fulfilment that has been evident through all of the first three chapters of Matthew. There have been consistent references all the way through these three chapters to the Old Testament prophets. Uh, who were all, these prophecies were all to be fulfilled in Jesus, the coming Messiah who has now appeared among us. God wrapped in human flesh. As Jesus, the one who will bring righteousness to a sin polluted humanity, it is important that he identifies with those he came to save. This identification with sinful people is here symbolised as John baptises him with water. The evidence that this fulfills all the intentions of the prophets come from God himself as he witnesses this humble submission to this baptism by his son. At that moment the heaven opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. A voice from heaven said, This is my son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. John baptises him with water and God sends the Holy Spirit to rest upon him as the ultimate seal of approval. Now the promises of the Old Testament scripture have been fulfilled. Jesus has fully identified with those who came to save and he is now ready to engage in a radical countercultural ministry among them. Challenge for us as members of the kingdom of God is to be just as countercultural in our day today among our people. There is a great spiritual need in the people God has positioned around us. And we all have a circle of influence. May we be bold in sharing the good news of Jesus who came to save his people from their sins. Amen.